So, uh, hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to this Magnet Seminar. Uh, today, we are really excited and happy to have this Pina uh, Kondopoulou uh, from the Aristotle University of Thess Thessaloniki in Greece, presenting a talk entitled Archaeomagnetic Research Through the Eyes of a Paleomagnetist, a Potential Impact of a, on a Study of Baked Clays in Various Geological Environments in Greece, um, please, Despina, go ahead and um, with your talk, and the floor is yours. Thank you. And I thank you, Anita, and hello to everybody. Um, today's seminar gives me the opportunity to present a brief overview of the archaeomagnetic data uh, obtained in Greece during the last approximately 25 years by Greek and or foreign uh, research groups. Assuming that the discipline is uh, familiar to the audience, I skip uh, all the introduction, uh, the, the usual introduction, and give some key points in order to enter the main presentation. So you all probably know that the suite of material which we use in archaeomagnetism, both uh, in situ and uh, move, uh, moving, I mean portable, are the kilns, the fired walls and pottery, and also ceramics, tiles, and other uh, items uh, made of baked clay. Though the preselection of material is uh, now being more and more uh, uh, detailed and careful, uh, successful results are not always obtained. And uh, this holds uh, mostly for the archaeo intensity ones. There are some uh, prerequisites and limitations for optimum results. I also go through this very quickly. The abundance of magnetic particles in the material, homogeneous material to be uh, selected uh, preferably, heating up to high temperatures, and of course, various, various environmental factors which may affect the material. Uh, in this um, slide, I present a broadly known in, by archeologists and archeometrists, so the studies of archeometry involve, involved here, uh, about the temperatures reached within an up draft kiln, circular one, and the rectangular these, uh, kiln. These are the most uh, familiar, uh, the most usual findings in excavated kilns in Greece. You will notice that the distribution of temperatures is more homogeneous in the updraft ones and uh, more scattered uh, in the orthogonal kilns, starting from very low values, 450, and reaching uh, approximately 1,000 Celsius. So a sampling within a, a, such a kiln has to take into consideration all these variations. Uh, the potential relation of a kiln's building material is closely related to the geological environment as uh, kilns are basically built with clays in very close neighborhood. People did not travel kilometers and kilometers to bring uh, clay for constructing a kiln. For pottery, an assemblage of various clays is uh, required and these can be collected in, into within considerable distances, so cannot be representative of the geology of of the area, but this has some ex exceptions as well, which I will present later. And we also have an intermediate class of materials in the broadly known name of ceramics, like tiles, bricks, pipes, etc. There are some basic experiments of magnetic mineralogy to conduct in archaeomagnetic study, and I don't speak about the more elaborated ones, which become more and more numerous. I just uh, limit to the basic ones, because this can be useful later, as I hope to show you. Um, the most important uh, factor in uh, the study of bait clays, the first one is the susceptibility, since it shows how the magnetic enhancement of fired clays can progress. And uh, this is monitored toward uh, versus uh, uh, thermal um, versus temperature and all related to the geological context of each site. A second group of measurements re uh, relies on the thermomagnetic analysis and the relevant tests 
that is the isothermal remanence. So by thermomagnetic analysis, you can see if we detect hematite, we have an advanced oxidation and some grain size distribution, where the isothermal remanence uh, shows us the main carriers of the magnetization. Uh, in the early 2000, uh, the study of the raw clays um, was uh, initiated in Bulgaria, and this, um, uh, I could say, innovative work by Giordano Vital uh, was followed by others uh, from Kostandino Vavram and Kovacheva, 2013-15. Now, uh, several authors include information about the clays used for the fire items, mostly kilns, during an archaeomagnetic study. And I cite uh, very briefly the last uh, uh, used and known to us. Uh, having accumulated quite a lot of experience on sampling uh, um, these structures, so mostly kilns, but also fired walls uh, in uh, Greece, we developed a new approach thinking that uh, and observing that all the above experiments, that is the simple ones I mentioned, are traditionally conducted within the frame of a classic paleomagnetic study, that is, on geological formations. So in the following, uh, I will first cite the actual state of the art of archaeomagnetism in Greece nowadays. Um, to give you an idea, though there were some preliminary data accumulated until 1995. Uh, the real start and kickoff of archaeomagnetism was done at the end of the 90s and mostly through the project of ARCH, the archaeological uh, archaeomagnetic applications for cultural heritage. Then I will display the geographic distribution of the studied fire structure versus the geological formations, and then we combine with distribution of paleomagnetic results. Now, the database of directional data from Greece was built uh, um, as a whole around 2014 by De Marco et al., but using data until 2010. This compilation, for which I just have one word to tell you more, uh, is the total absence of uh, results through all the islands of Eastern Aegean, which provided lots, lots of pottery and amphoras uh, known to have traveled uh, towards Sicily, towards the Black Sea. So, and there were reports of excavated kills, which never survived because these islands are very touristic and excavations never followed the, let's say, the legal rule. So everything disappeared. This, this uh, compilation gave uh, rise to the first secular variation curves for Greece for directions, which you can see here by the same publication. And uh, in, this, um, uh, in these curves, we observe uh, problems, and um, I mean, empty places for the, the prehistoric periods. This part, which corresponds to the Dark Ages, is also uh, only calculated, but not really um, based on data. And surprisingly, this part corresponding to the late, uh, late Roman, early Byzantine, I mean, post-Roman, let's say, mostly, uh, period, which is very well covered by structures in Greece, was almost totally unexploited. For this reason, we worked uh, on the last uh, 2,000 years by uh, sampling ourselves, but also accumulating the high quality results which were available in the bibliography. And there were new curves um, covering this part. I have to, well, it's written, this is based on Lanaus technique, but uh, the new curves published in 2021 are based in a new uh, technique uh, built uh, by Simos Pasov, uh, who is going to present it in a separate paper and uh, with, uh, together with uh, Elena Ilona. Now, the same uh, uh, distribution uh, holds for intensities, where we have four times more data as it is understandable. And here we plot the location of sampling, not fabrication, which is very often uh, different, but of course it was not easy to plot also the fabrication side. This was also compiled by De Marco et al. 2008, 
and um, gave rise to this uh, curve, also built uh, with um, Lanos method. But uh, since then, of course, uh, many data points were acquired after 2008, which are here uh, uh, plotted uh, in red, stars and, and dots, and are being continuously um, completed with uh, the last, well, you can hear, see them, hear the publications which um, gave uh, these results, and the brand new one, which is now online in Pepe covering the Bronze Age, this period of the Bronze Age. Uh, we have worked with the Spanish uh, team of Madrid, uh, mostly for Rivero Montero's uh, thesis, which was um, uh, defended uh, last year on uh, the part of the magnetic field anomalies around uh, the place where we expected to find at the time, uh, the LIA, the Levantine Iron Age anomaly. So we focused to 1600 BC until 100 AD. Um, and uh, this, uh, the, the, this compilation and this work was also done for Italy. But here I present only the Greek data and you can see how we managed to elaborate uh, this, oh, sorry, uh, this uh, anomaly and also drew a, a new curve, uh, which you can see here for this time period. So we complete by, by pieces. I hope that one day um, somebody, not me because I retired, will build the new curve for this as a whole. Um, um, schematic distribution of excavated kilns in Greece uh, they are in a, a database available online, which uh, I can send to everybody who is interested. Different colors represent different archaeological periods. Just to give you an idea, because uh, these dots correspond often to workshops and not to only one kiln. Um, this uh, work started in 2002 by Eleni Hasaki, now professor at Tucson, Arizona, who counted at that uh, up to that moment, 567 excavated kilns. By now, I think they have uh, passed the 700 maybe uh, all over the country. Uh, following this, we plotted by red dots. They are a little bit small, but I hope that you can see them. Uh, inside the various, this is the geological map of Greece. Greece is geologically a very, very complicated area. I have to underline this because clearly everybody is not familiar with the geology of Greece, which represents everything you can imagine, alpine formations, pre-alpine formations, post-alpine formations. And uh, so it is becoming a real, um, uh, let's say, challenge to try to combine uh, structures, archaeological structures with the geology. So here you see the distribution of excavated kilns within the geological zones of Greece. And in order to make this uh, figure clearer, we represent it uh, in this pie diagram, if I can say that, where you see that alluvial deposits at 61% are um, are surrounding the excavated kilns. Second, come uh, the grass and the granitic rocks, broadly 20%. These, both these give us complications, which I will try to monitor later. The same holds for the intensities. Uh, you can see the black dots here and also here. Uh, you should not be surprised by the fact that everything is everything is concentrated in North and Central Greece. It's because our lab is here and uh, we had access uh, to mostly the formations in Northern Greece, mostly for intensities because all the data I have shown to you before come, uh, for the directions uh, do not yield always uh, uh, measurements or results for intensities due to lack of experiments. So here we have about 50% alluvial deposits, a lot of metamorphic rocks and limestones, let's say, coming second. In the same map, we have plotted the paleomagnetic data obtained in Greece. There is a huge 
paleomagnetic database, um, which was built, uh, I think, three years or four years ago through a project, the HELPOS project. And of course, uh, encompasses all the results obtained in Greece by several uh, teams, Dutch, French, English, British, uh, sometime, and uh, Italian, I think, recently. Um, so what you see here, these dots are areas where we have paleomagnetic and because we don't care about tectonic implications, but we do care about the rock magnetism of the studied formations. So all these um, blue points are the paleomagnetic data and the uh, yellow triangles are the excavated kilns uh, in all periods, prehistoric, geometric, classical, and Hellenistic, I guess Roman as well. So in this, in this map, there is uh, an obvious wide distribution of paleomagnetic data in Greece, and we have a, an important and clear information about the initial geological formations and their magnetic potential. So I selected a few examples uh, from different geological zones and archaeological periods to document uh, this approach. Um, these four sites come from the peninsula of, uh, I have maps, so I just uh, give you the first idea. The peninsula of uh, Halkidiki, Olympia and Sunny. This is in central Greece, Thessaly, and this is uh, Thessaloniki within the city. This is archaeomagnetic, uh, archaeomagnetism part is successful for two out of five kilns. Sunny uh, successful for three out of three, two out of two, and successful for three out of three, but an additional data set of seven other studied kilns within the Saloniki was used also for comparison. Every one of these kilns was successful. Uh, the basic experiments which uh, we explore were the, you know, the Lowry experiment, thermomagnetic analysis, IRM, again and again. So uh, in all these um, uh, sites, we have several examples of rock magnetism quite thoroughly uh, examined. Uh, step by step, let's go first to the studied site of Olympiada, which is in the beginning of the Mount uh, Athos, the monastic uh, area of Mount Athos. We have uh, some the five pottery kilns uh, of early Hellenistic period, that is after the death of Alexander the Great, that is the Hellenistic period. Uh, you can see the kilns, uh, one, two, three, four, and there were two here, so five kilns as a whole. Two, as I said before, two out of five were successful only. And why, how can we possibly explain this? Well, this is the geological map of the area. The geological setting comprises granite, amphibolites, gnes, and some lacustrine and marine sediments. The paleomagnetism done on rocks from the broader study area was already published by Westphal and authors in 1991. Uh, these paleomagnetic results were obtained in sediments and volcanics, and they were unable to provide any reliable direction. The archaeomagnetic results, um, though promising in the beginning, they show reversibility, one magnetic phase, but only two out of five kins were uh, providing uh, reliable results. So this is not really very important. It's because we studied also uh, XRPD and petrography, etc. The atmosphere of firing, as uh, you probably remember for orthogonal kilns, uh, lies between these values and so is extremely variable. We move to uh, Sunny, which is the other uh, finger of Halkidiki Peninsula, uh, the early Byzantine settlement of uh, with uh, five kings, but only three were sampled. Um, they had approximately this uh, uh, feature, and they all worked perfectly. Here is the geological, mostly uh, sedimentary neogene sediments and including uh, red marls, which are really prominent in the area. I mean, everything is red and alluvial deposits. The paleomagnetism of the rocks, while, uh, uh, while it was thoroughly studied, um, did not, uh, was not published for several reasons. By, and the study was done by uh, Scholger, Maurich, and myself. 
So all the, the, all the data are, are shown here, uh, the paleomagnetic data, quite promising, unfortunately not published. Monitoring of susceptibility with temperature does not show significant changes and so on. And here we calculated, but indirectly, uh, with, uh, based on the geography, the temperature distribution uh, was the same as previously. We moved southwards to Thessaly, uh, to a Neolithic site, uh, you see 5,600, uh, 4, 4,600, uh, where two filed structures. Uh, this is the geology. I mean, the, the, the reasoning is the same. Ophiolite, limestones, and also fluvial like stream deposits, and lots of alluvial, there are lots of rivers here. The paleomagnetism of the rocks, also published in 1997, was very successful for the lavas, but not at all for the sediments, which probably gave rise to the pottery, which was also, I forgot to tell you that pottery was also collected here and was disastrous. No one, uh, not a single one reliable result could be obtained out of 40 fragments. Uh, the temperature, yes, the temperatures were calculated between 600 and 900, uh, so it was uh, quite good for, for um, our experiments, but the atmosphere was uh, reduction, reduction, reduction and short firing duration, so this probably affected the ceramics. And uh, coming to the uh, last uh, example, but the most rich, I think, is within the city of Thessaloniki, where three kilns were excavated during a, a metro excavation uh, for building a new station uh, close to the railway station. You see the three kilns uh, around, this is Ottoman, around 1500 AD and uh, around 40 hand samples uh, separately oriented, uh, published in 2021. But in Thessaloniki, previously, uh, there were studies, as I told you, on another seven kings within the city, within the same uh, central western part of the city, and uh, by Evans and uh, myself with Spataras. And all these kings gave reliable results here, represent to you the geological setting of the area, quaternary flu fluvial lacustrine sediments, red clays also very prominent. The paleomagnetism rocks from the broader study area published in 1992, 2000 um, was uh, done on major formations along the Axios River, which is, uh, sorry, running here, and which has provided all the sediments on which the Saloniki is built, I mean, above their bedrock, which is a schist uh, mostly. Um, so the archaeomagnetic results from all published and new data explain very, very well why uh, we have uh, reliable directions. And there you can see uh, a, a drill with a geological uh, section and displaying very well the red clay series, which are um, responsible for most of our constructions. All this is about kilns, but I would like to tell you a few words about pottery. As I said before, pottery collections are more complicated, but often uh, we have uh, their provenance within a reasonable distance from the place of their firing, either because it is coarse pottery or because uh, it is an old one, I mean, uh, prehistoric, but not a uh, Bronze Age, but earlier Neolithic. And this, um, in, in these periods, people were limited to their, let's say, easy access areas. So in that cases, we can consider that this pottery for which I also have to add that there are several archaeological and archaeometric uh, studies come from the same geological formations. Then we can assume that a similar examination of the raw materials as above can be justified. We have two examples to show you, the island of Thassos, North Aegean, and the site opposite, the Kilitash opposite the continental site. Um, I go next and then I come back. So I talk about this area. 
Okay, here. So the other sides were here, 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 and the salonic. Now moving here, these uh, these areas uh, are situated uh, within the crystalline metamorphic Rhodop massive. Uh, the archaeomagnetic studies in both areas proved to yield partly satisfying results from Thasos Bronze Age collections. That is five to six fragments were successful out of 36 sampled and studied, but failed completely for three collections of Neolithic pottery covering the whole fifth millennium for the Kilitash. That is a total of 45 fragments, a whole millennium, and we were really hoping to obtain uh, data from this collection, which remains, of course, unpublished. A few a small part is published by Fangida. So with the experience acquired now, I would say, because several of these uh, samplings, I mean, the, the kilns were sampled in the 15 and apart the Thessaloniki part, the other kilns were sampled 10 and 15 years ago. With the accumulated experience, I would look more carefully to the geological maps of the area before sampling, because you all know how painful it can be to try to obtain results and do measurements and measurements and end with zero. Now, uh, the failed experiment, for example, for Dikilitas is this one. This is uh, the material. Uh, this is a very well known and it obtained a French uh, prize of uh, Cino del Duca institution. Uh, it's a really huge excavation. You see that the preselection was fine. All the samples were like that. It's not a good example I'm choosing. Um, the three axes gave um, uh, good uh, information, but they arise uh, disastrous. And all, it all went uh, along like that. So to conclude, Greece uh, is spread with a great amount of archaeological finds. Uh, and uh, they are everywhere. There are uh, exceptionally well-studied uh, ceramic collections and pottery collections. And it would be a bliss to better exploit this potential. Now, uh, among, among the various approaches, I know that there are approaches suggested worldwide, but what we propose here is simple uh, to look, let's say, more carefully to the geology and to try to see if there are paleomagnetic data around, which they are most often, and use this database properly uh, in order to limit, let's say, the failure of an archaeomagnetic study. I want to make clear that we cannot and certainly will not select kilns on the basis of this, but we could try to reduce the failure, eliminate not promising candidates. For instance, I would not sample on the other, uh, the five kilns I have shown to you, because this they belong to a, a historical period in which we have plenty, plenty of uh, uh, constructions. The Hellenistic period is extremely well documented in Greece. It's not something rare. And the time it took us to study, mostly Emanuela de Marco, who used these samples for her thesis, she lost, she lost a lot of time. It would not be a, a wise thing to do. Uh, and it, to complete our um, let's say, our approach, we are working more with um, geologists and mineralogists in the last years in order to help um, the evolution of our archaeomagnetic studies. And here I have to also say once more, I retired two years ago. I hope to be able to help in the lab, but um, my colleague Alina is taking the floor and she already took it some years ago. So I can only hope that she will go on. That's all. I thank you for, uh, oh, yes, before I finish, there are a few people I want to thank. Um, Greek archaeologists as a whole uh, support and encouraged us. The FRHs that are the local uh, um, gov governmental uh, directions in Northern Greece have supported our work, as well as Delphi, Halkis, and the Cycladic Islands, and also our department, uh, the French School in Athens, and the ISTAP Center for both financial and scientific assistance in the last years. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And so for the audience, now there is space for questions. If you have any, you can uh, raise your hand or you can use the chat to write your questions. Uh, Gunther, you have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you, yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. And uh, I, I am aware that uh, in uh, terms of the archaeological artifacts that you described, these kilns, there was also a lot of volcanic eruptions yes. that produced yes. a lot of uh, tephra. Yes. And I wonder if there is any kind of a, like a matching, matching approach that you would you know, try to figure out the TRM of the tephras that are fairly well known or somewhat known when they deposited, along with those archaeological artifacts from the kilns and pottery. Um, may I answer? Uh, this, this work could be done only in one place in Greece, in Santorini, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the eruptive island of Santorini. There, there were, yes, uh, detailed studies on lavas by Donald Tarling, by Bill Downey. To my knowledge, no one else. Uh, and there were also um, archaeomagnetic data from pottery, no, from kills, sorry. But to my knowledge, there was no uh, effort to combine, as you say, um, and, and you keep in mind that these studies were quite old. I mean, the 80s, early 90s. So yes, it is this something which could be done, but has not been done up to now. Thank you very much. Again, I really like your talk and good work. I'm happy good, that you did, work. really happy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we all enjoyed your talk, Despina. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, that makes me less anxious. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you really did a lot of work in all these years. It's, uh, it's going to be a legacy. That, uh... Yes, I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope to be able to continue for a while because I really like this discipline. I really do. Thank you. Um, is, uh, is there uh, another question from the audience? Oh, okay. Let's uh, let's give Kathy that uh, priority wow. first. Yes, please wow. go ahead. Hello, Kathy. <laughs> Hello. Wow, thank you. <laughs> Hello. It's lovely, lovely to see you, and really nice. It's so nice to hear all of that work come together. Exactly. I'm very happy that I mentioned the art project. I was not sure. <laughs> <Right. to be. laughs> no, it's it's really nice to see, as I say, the legacy of it all. And what yeah. I was wondering is, is there a prospect of going back to some of the samples where you have directional data and now doing intensity measurements and what's the the relative um, merits of doing intensity measurements on ceramics as opposed to fired structures um, well we do I mean Elida has set up uh, the tele experiment in our lab so there are uh, uh, there is work coming out as publications on intensities only. The mm -hmm. big problem is that we have difficulties to find the uh, structure in situ. And we were really very, very lucky to have found all the structures which were included in Emanuela's uh, thesis. And because there are no public works, that's very simple. Or mm -hmm. if there are, uh, there was, for example, a pipe installation in Northern Greece and uh, everything was uh let's say buried in order to keep it for the next generations so we have difficulties we try we have very good connections with the archaeological community the departments and the efforts um of course we want to do this but i don't want to speak uh for elena because she has maybe to to reply to that uh we do our best through what we can find mm -hmm. and and can you can you look back at earlier samples uh, so to remeasure but to measure this time the intensity oh no we don't have access i mean in uh, um, when when we started to really work on archaeomagnetism in our lab um 
everything was measured for both intensity and directions. Mm -hmm. And we don't have all, all the samples. We have samples which we have not measured yet, but they come from our collections the last uh, five, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have early samples, unfortunately. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We oh, don't. That's good. Yeah. yeah. But it's great. It's so nice to see it together. And yeah. so nice to see you, okay. Kathy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Gunther has a second question. Please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, and I can hear and I can see you now. That's better. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you have indicated that the, the Greece has a lot of complex geology, as you yes. showed in the map. Yes. And, uh, and then I got the feeling that somehow it was reflected by, uh, by the magnetic data that you had, meaning that there was probably different rocks that uh, were available for the kiln. So what was the, what was the relationship uh, between the very complex geology and the magnetic data that you have discussed? Um, well, I try to answer to my best, because when we did all the paleomagnetic sampling, which uh, started in the late 80s in Greece, of course, there was nothing to do with uh, archaeomagnetism. But uh, uh, well, I have to start in a different way. The target of the paleomagnetic measurements in Greece at that time was mostly tectonic. I mean, we needed to, um, to document rotations. And as a second step, by different teams, magnetostratigraphy. And this was uh, an overall target, not only our lab, but also a big um, projects from other labs, as for example, Netherlands and uh, France, the Gilles Surivet lab and Utrecht lab, and also uh, um, Great Britain, I mean, uh, Tony Morris' uh, work. So this all had to do with geodynamics. But within these studies, there is included a precious database of rock magnetic uh, information. So according to where our kilns are, which we now know, but of course we did not know at that period, we try to see if the sampling we did, because as you understand, we did not sample metamorphic rocks. We sampled uh, sediments, we sampled lavas, and uh, partly granites. So there, if there are connections of the magnetic properties on both, that is the target. I don't know if I answered well. You, you always answer well. And I have a follow-up <laughs> question uh, because okay. of the very contrasting geology. I would assume that there is also um, kind of like a map of magnetic anomalies of Greece, which means that some areas would have yes. a much larger magnetic field compared That's to right. the other. Yeah, and right. if you yes. if you took, if you took it into account when you were no. uh, trying to make uh, some kind of a geomagnetic, no, we did not. Uh, we did not. No, because this cannot be combined. I mean, I'm positive on that. Uh, we have uh, maps uh, and we have a very performant team of uh, uh, applied geophysics. We have modelings of the geomagnetic field, but this is uh, modeled uh, according to days, to daily, yearly um, variations. So this could influence the magnetic refraction, maybe, maybe, but it doesn't play any important role on the magnetism, which is recorded uh, in the rocks. No, it doesn't, it doesn't affect. Well, uh, thank you very much. If I you really... want something else, you can email me. If you want something, I can give you some information, you can email me. Well, you have said at, during your talk that you would uh, make available some of the database to anyone who is interested. So I would be the one yes. interested. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank okay. you. So, Anita, I think it's for you now. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, I want to give priority to uh, anybody else who has a question. Mm. But I guess my question was um, 
regarding so the kilns and the ceramics. So uh, the provenance of the ceramics would be different. So perhaps uh, they would, of course, give only palintensi data, but maybe um, more reliable. Do you see this in 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 your results? Um, we have few examples where we. Uh, obtained uh, uh, data from both kilns and the production. Okay, in, in, in what I have shown you, we only have this in one kiln in Thessaloniki. There are other cases, for example, uh, Paros Island in the Cycladic complex, where we had both uh, the kiln and the ceramics. In Thessaloniki, um, they were both working very well. And we know that the ceramics were local uh, by the archaeologists and also by the fact that they were used for uh, domestic use. So in that cases, you don't search for elaborate, uh, you know, constructions. In Paros Island, uh, the Paros Island is the first. Uh, uh, if you want to, if you go back to the presentation, the front slide shows Emanuela sampling uh, the Paros Island uh, kilns on the right top. The pottery worked better than the kilns because there is an explanation, of course, because the kilns were built without uh, limestone, uh, within limestones, which we did not know. And we moved to the Cycladic Islands. The whole team, Emanuela, Irini, uh, Zandaniri, myself, uh, to sample with the archaeologist who had excavated. And what she forgot to tell us that this was mostly limestone. So imagine that we have to do a lot of work to try to sample the, the clays which were incorporated within the limestone. So only two out of uh, five kilns worked. But the, yes. pot the pottery was absolutely fine. It was published by Evdokia Tema and co-authors in 2012. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. So I would like to thank everybody for joining um, uh, to the seminars this year. Uh, 22 was a great year. Um, we hope to uh, continue next year. We have already a lineup of speakers, but we are still looking for more speakers. And so you're welcome to contact uh, any one of the team. and. Would like to remind you that uh, previous talks are public available on YouTube, and you're welcome to um, to follow our YouTube uh, channel and like it and watch it and watch it as much as you want. And um, thanks again, and we would like to um, to uh, wish you the best for this year and see you next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>